Hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual speaker series. This is our spotlight on deaf and hard of hearing healthcare professionals. And this is part of our Healthcare System Transformation Project, or HSTP, under the Rhode Island Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. My name is Christine West, and I'm the project manager for HSTP. Joining us today from all the way across the country is Dr. Jamie Wilson. He is a PhD, an LP, an ABN, and a board certified neuropsychologist and a rehabilitation psychologist as well. Jamie works with deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind, and blind individuals. Welcome, Dr. Wilson. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being invited to speak today. I'm very excited about it. Well, thank you so much for supporting our pro program here in Rhode Island. To get started, I'd like to know a little bit about who you are. If you could just tell us about your background, where you were born, how you got interested in the field of psychology, a little bit more about your educational journey and any barriers you might have faced or had to overcome, and also how you got to where you are today. Sure, Christine. Again, thank you so much for having me speak today and sharing my experience. Going back to the very beginning, I was actually born in Missouri. And when I was about a year old, my mother noticed that I was beginning to say words, but I wasn't actually making any sounds with my voice, which she thought was a little bit peculiar. So she brought me to the pediatrician and of course I was tested and they found out that I was profoundly deaf in both ears. So I was diagnosed with a sensory neural hearing loss in both ears. It's interesting, the doctor told my mom, who knew nothing about deafness, had never even met a deaf person in her life, she knew nothing about deaf culture or sign language. The doctor said to my mother, do not teach your son sign language. Absolutely do not teach him sign language. Teach him how to speak and how to lip read. You want him to be just like everyone else. And my mother said, well, sure, of course. So she, um, followed all the advice about speech therapy and so forth. Now we were in Missouri at that time, but we then moved to Florida. We moved to a very small town in Florida called Jupiter. It's actually an island in southern Florida. And speech therapy was not really available unless you were willing to travel for three hours. And so my mother took me as just a little guy on a three hour drive to a speech therapist where I would receive therapy for say one or two hours and then another three hour drive back home. So it was an entire day, eight hours driving there, getting the speech therapy. And that was three times a week. One of the things the speech therapist did which I thought was really interesting, was that she put a little bit of peanut butter on my nose, on my cheek, on my chin, and my other cheek, so that I would have to lick it. I think the speech therapist thought, at least back in those days, you know, this is in the 70s, they thought that it would make my tongue stronger, and that would help me say words better. I honestly don't know if that helped or not, but I will say that I am now 
a huge fan of peanut butter. I absolutely love it. Which is really funny because uh, it has a lot of calories. <laughs> and uh, I have to work out and uh, keep those pounds off. Anyway. So that was my speech therapy story from the beginning. And when I was around six years old, we moved to Utah. My dad's best friend at that time was interested in starting a business in Utah. And they really did have a good reputation in that area for speech therapy. You might recognize this name. You know the Osmond family or the Osmond brothers, those musicians? Donnie and Marie Osmond, they were very famous. Well, they had a brother who was the same age as me, and the two of us attended school together. They had a, a family speech program, and so we were classmates in this program and we had speech therapy together on a regular basis. Even in my teenage years, uh, I really didn't know any signing deaf people. I had never met a deaf, signing deaf person, just Justin Osman. Uh, he and I were the only two that uh, were close friends and then the other students who were learning to speak and lip read. And it's interesting because when I look back on those years at the speech center, we had a Christmas program. I remember one year they would choose the top student to go ahead and read to an audience from a book. And it was a way for them to show off, you know, the talents of their, their students. The motto of that, that program was a child shall speak. So clearly the oral philosophy was very strong there. <clears throat> and um, I was chosen to read for the program, the book, The Night Before Christmas. I was seven years old and I remember it vividly. I had to read in front of all the parents and all the families that had deaf children, which I did. Um, I didn't really know this at the time, but looking back on it, you know, that was a profound experience. I was always mainstreamed, and I was always the only deaf student among hearing students. I really didn't have any sign language interpreter, obviously, if I was an oral student. And there was a person in the school, their title was Hearing Impaired Speech Support Person. And that was a person that would help me out if I missed something, like I missed an assignment. This person would confer with the teacher find out what the assignment was that I might have missed or missed the uh, explanation. And then she would say it to me, you know, you missed this assignment. This is what you're, need, what you're expected to do. So, uh, oh my goodness. It was arduous. It was a lot. It took longer. Everything took so much longer. When I got to high school, my sophomore year in high school, I did meet another deaf oral student, but that student uh, introduced me to two other students who were ASL users. So that was my first experience with ASL. And those students had what's called a hearing impaired uh, sign support person who accompanied them to class, whereas I had the speech support person. But we all hung out together and I started learning a little bit of sign language, some basic terminology. And honestly, from that point on, I was really drawn to American Sign Language because that was my world. 
That's where I belonged. At the time, I played baseball in high school. I was on the team, of course, again, only the only deaf person on the team, and the other boys were hearing. And the teammates could all, you know, talk to each other and talk about the different plays and the game. And I really couldn't be included in those conversations. I missed out on what they were talking about. And that was a struggle for me. I decided that I really wanted the experience, especially in baseball, to be on a team where communication was completely accessible. And that's how I learned about Gallaudet University in Washington, DC. And I also found out they had a baseball team. So I went ahead and prepared my application for Gallaudet University. And I attended Gallaudet to play baseball. What an experience that was. I have to say it was a shock. It was a really different world. Um, you know, there's the hearing world, and I played baseball in that hearing world, and then there's the deaf world of baseball. And communication was completely different. You can always understand what's going on. The pitcher and the coach could talk about what to do next. They could talk about various plays. And it was incredible. It was like I had left planet Earth and I'd gone to a completely different planet where communication was fully understandable. And what an immersion it was for me to be in the world of deaf people who used American Sign Language. I'm so grateful I had that experience. It really opened my eyes to what's possible out there. It's the fact that there is this new world where everything is accessible. Education is accessible. You can understand things in general. And I just uh, love the academic opportunity at Gallaudet too because you have direct instruction. You're not getting it through a third party. To be honest with you though, at the same time, I was going through the experience of culture shock. Having grown up in the hearing world, uh, having that opportunity to go to Gallaudet with you know, deaf power and all the uh, cultural implications of being at Gallaudet, I did feel a little bit homesick. I lasted two years at Gallaudet before I decided to go ahead and transfer to a college that was closer to home. And I ended up at Brigham Young University. They, um, there was a deaf world there, but it was much smaller. I would say there were about six or seven deaf signing students altogether out of 40 maybe hard of hearing students. And I also had access to the hearing world that I was very used to. But I was a little bit, you know, when I got tired of the hearing world, I could go take a vacation in the deaf world. That was my vacation spot. It was nice to have that social interaction. Christine is saying yes, and you could go from one world to the next easily. So I continued my academic studies at Brigham Young. I had several majors. I had had several majors. I was interested in marine biology, and I was interested in computer science. And I would change my major frequently because as a freshman, you know, I was still thinking about what I really wanted to do. But psychology had a very big impact on me because of some family influences. I actually had, uh, well, both of my parents really, well, let's say this way. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. 
and everything. So I did have an aunt who had graduated from college and she actually became a marriage and child family therapist, which had a big influence on me. She was my maternal aunt and of everyone in my family. Um, and by the way, my family, my mother's side of the family was Israeli. So my aunt had actually been working with Holocaust survivors. She was telling me stories and um, talking to me about what people who went through the Holocaust actually lived through. And she talked to me about the tattoos on their arms, the fact that numbers would be tattooed down the forearm. And she, uh, she explained this to me and I found it fascinating. And she told me how she was able to help people, believe it or not, forgive and move on and let go of this traumatic experience and get on with their lives. And I just thought that was fascinating. So that's how I got started in psychology. That was the beginning of getting hooked on psychology. I also really love the brain. And I'm fascinated with the anatomy of the brain and the different parts of the brain and how they connect with various behaviors and with language deprivation and the impact on the brain. So here in this portion of the brain, we have various areas that are separated by a band. The band is connected. And that band is a little bit weak when there's language dep deprivation without any stimulation to the brain early in life, that band is very weak. So once I understood that anatomy of the brain, I decided to really focus on neuropsychology. One of my professors at Brigham and Young was Dr. Aaron Baylor who came up with the 3D model of the brain, a 3D MRI. And that, once I saw that, the hook was fully <laughs> into me. I couldn't leave this area. It was just too fascinating for me. I had to pursue it. So I went ahead and applied for graduate school. I took the GRE exam and so forth. During my interview, you know, it's an all-day process, as you can imagine. I believe it's a three-day, all-day process. And the faculty typically interviews each applicant. And they ask me things like, hmm, well, if you're deaf, how are you going to do this program? And so I did a lot of explaining. I had an interpreter with me for the interview. And I said, uh, there would be an interpreter there. You have a department for disability access services. And that department will provide interpreter services. And then they asked me how much that would cost. And I had to educate them. I had to explain how everything worked. I really did have to be my own advocate. I wanted to dispel any doubts they might have or any negativity they might have about admitting me. Still, I was worried. I didn't know if they'd accept me or not. But fortunately, they did accept me. Our program had 10 people in the cohort. When I think back on that, um, we did have the interpreter, of course. St 
still, it's tricky to be the one deaf or hard of hearing person in a group of hearing people. So in lively discussions, you know, I had an interpreter, but I could never tell who was talking because of the rapid fire exchange. And so I had to kind of pick and choose what I would hear. I might focus in on two or three students. And I actually became close with them. And they were kind of my support team. They actually helped me through the program. It took me 17 years to complete all of my studies, my doctoral degree. After that, I went for the licensure exam and the legal exam and the board exam, etc. It's a lot of hoops to go through to get where I finally ended up, but I was following my passion. And there were times, you know, it, it can get discouraging. There were times when my professor or the faculty um, that I didn't meet during the interview would arise in my studies and I'd show up in class with my interpreter and they would be alarmed and try to figure out what's going on. And I'd have to once again do my self-advocacy from the very beginning with that new faculty person to dispel any fears they might have about having me as their student. And they weren't used to having a deaf person or an interpreter in their class. Uh, they, you know, they didn't know what would happen. So there was negativity and I was a little bit afraid myself. I really relied on, you know, peer support. And oftentimes, whenever needed, I'd go back to the deaf community, to my other world, and take a sip of deaf culture just to fill me up and restore my faith in humanity again. That was so important for me to have that option. It was interesting. Did you have another question, Christine? Thank you for that uh, and for sharing that information. That's just so interesting. You mentioned... Um, in your life experience growing up, uh, you mentioned the speech therapy and the long drive to go to that therapist and then how long it took you to finally meet someone who knew sign language. And I'm just curious, from your professional view as a psychologist and you specialize in communication, you know, and you know how important it is to have communication from a very young age if a child has no access to sign language or communication, well, how important is that? How does that impact self-esteem? How does that impact a self of identity, sense of identity or a sense of belonging, fitting in? Would you talk about that a little bit, please? Yes, that's an excellent question. Because communication is critical and it had a huge impact on me throughout my life. There are so many different paths one might take. And with a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people, they have language deprivation. And really, it is so critical to have language exposure between the ages of birth to five. That time period actually has a name. It's called the critical period. And after that age of five, that critical period closes. And the brain, to some degree, um, loses its plasticity. So that neuroplasticity tends to shift and it's cemented at around age five, which means language exposure prior to that is critical. I did have a first language as a child. My parents read me books. They exposed language to me. 
I was really, really into reading. I love to read. I love kids' stories. So I did have language exposure, and I did have the one-on-one -on -one experience of language exposure. You know, I, I'm an only child, which is very helpful. So when, you, when I meet other people that didn't have that early exposure in their families, like I met one client who had seven siblings, and his parents just didn't have the time to teach to learn sign language or teach this person language in a direct one-on-one -on -one fashion. So this person had a real lack of understanding about so many things, like what was being discussed at the dinner table. He would just sit and eat dinner with no interaction with his siblings. And he ended up becoming rebellious and actually ended up becoming um, a criminal and was in jail for 40 years because he didn't understand the rules of society. He was intelligent, but he had no early access to language. And that had a huge impact on his life. It causes brain damage. Another thing that's really important, having to do with language acquisition. You have a weakness in an area called theory of mind and with a weakness in that area it makes it difficult for you to take the perspective of another person. You tend to have a lack of empathy so you don't understand other people's feelings or perspectives. Um, I remember I had one patient who had severe language deprivation and went into a grocery store. This person had a staff with a staff person with them because he wasn't able to live independently. And um, so they're in the food store shopping and he wanted an item and reached for it and grabbed it out of someone else's cart and put it in his own cart. And um, he could have found it on the shelf, but there it was in someone else's cart. He wasn't able to understand that it belonged to someone else. And you can see how that would be for deaf and hard of hearing people. Quite often, what I see is um, the person might sign beautifully, but when you sign back to that person, they have trouble understanding what you're signing. They really don't understand the nuances of everything you've signed. So it's hard to diagnose patients like that because you see that they're able to use sign language, but they're not able to understand sign language because they've never been modeled dialogue in their early life. They don't have early acquisition of sign language. Sometimes hearing people will say, you know, why doesn't my friend, my deaf friend, uh, why do they get mad at me so easily? Um, I don't understand how they're thinking. And, you know, again, that's a part of the theory of mind situation where they're not able to empathize or see another point of view. And it can make it very difficult for hearing people to understand deaf culture and for deaf people to understand the culture where there's a language deprivation. So it's really tricky. Language and culture are intertwined and you really do need a strong theory of mind to be successful. So I'm fascinated with that. You talked about the critical period and how it's so important to have early language exposure. With language deprivation, there is a lack of theory of mind. I'm wondering, could a person catch up? Could they develop a theory of mind later in life? Or is that something that really it's, I need to know. I mean, can you explain how that might work? That's a great question. 
And that's something that um, I really work hard on with my patients. And I notice with different people, there are different outcomes and different success levels. It's like comparing people with plants. You know, um, if one plant gets a lot of water, it might not survive because you've given it too much water. If another plant doesn't get enough water, it might somehow manage. It's really tricky because each plant is different and each person is different. I have had several patients come to my treatment center for therapy and their parents um, were excited to learn sign language. They are, for example, here's a great example. Sometimes you'll, see, you'll meet parents who adopted a deaf person from another country, from Russia or from China, and they were so excited to adopt a child and they might get a 12-year-old child from an orphanage who had never had any language exposure. So they moved to this country this child. And they're working with this family. The family tries to expose them to ASL, but already they have a lot of emotional work to do. And so we have to work on that exposure. And they do pick up sign language, very basic sign language vocabulary. Some actually develop beautifully, but emotional problems seem to be one shared barrier. They just, it's very hard to overcome that, especially in terms of attachment. And that's a whole other part of language deprivation. You know, that's another area of the brain, that area that allows you to attach to others and form relationships. And have a real sense of stability with your emotions. And that also ties into theory of mind. And that's a lifelong endeavor. It's a lifelong struggle. And, you know, it's a catch-22. When you have a deaf child from another country, they need a family. They need love. But when they're adopted at age 12 or later, how can you make the best of a situation like that where their brain has already somewhat fossilized? You know, it's uh, become, like I said earlier, like concrete. Thank you for explaining that, doctor. Now, I wanted to get to another topic. I want to talk about psychological evaluations and how important it is to get a valid result related to deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind individuals. I wonder if you could explain a little bit about valid results and um, how it pertains to communication. I'd love to hear what you can tell us about that. Yes, so a neuropsych evaluation. They're fascinating and I love uh, doing them I love scoring them, and I love interpreting those tests as well. You end up, in the end, produ producing a report of your results and your findings. One thing that I've seen is there's a huge division between a valid assessment versus a semi-valid or not valid assessment. and how that test is given. When you evaluate an individual directly using that person's language, their native language, you're most likely to come up with a valid assessment. Now, let me just talk about what that means. If the person can be communicated with in their language directly, That's one thing, but if you have a hearing evaluator who doesn't 
know the person's language and they bring in an ASL interpreter, they think they're solving the problem, but in fact, they're not. The ASL interpreter is there. They're interpreting on the fly. And so uh, the evaluator is using a tool that's then being interpreted on the fly. And even if it's a good ASL interpreter, you know, they would normally prepare for a test like that. But it's very tricky. You have to get the transcript in advance. And the transcript of those tests are very hard to come by to actually prepare an interpretation and do an excellent job. So the evaluator usually has an interpreter that's doing their very best, but they struggle. And I'll see if I can give you an example. I might want to ask a deaf person, how much is a quarter and a dime? And that terminology is specific quarter, dime. The interpreter, very naturally, is going to sign 25 and 10, which is essentially giving away the answer, which is not my intention. So if you say how much is a quarter and a dime and you just spell out the words, you're not necessarily reaching them. So that's an example of how you can actually give away the answer and then ultimately skew the diagnosis. And that really causes problems. So you want a good diagnosis because you don't want the person placed in an institution or placed in prison even, um, or released early from prison because of a misdiagnosis because they haven't received the treatment that they needed. There are so many factors to consider when we talk about the validity of evaluations. So a, di <coughs> a direct evaluation in the native language of the person that you're evaluating is the best way to communicate, not through a third party, because that will skew the results. And that might be different than what you might see with somatic examples. For example, when you go to a doctor's appointment, you may have an interpreter there for your physical. That's no problem because it's a physical exam. But when you get to psychological or neurological evaluations, communication is the way we communicate. And communication has to be direct and li linguistically proficient for it to be valid. So I hope that separation is clear, that you could have a valid test, a semi-valid test, or a test that's completely invalid. And sadly, what I see is an interpreter attempting to interpret for a doctor in the evaluation room, and then the doctor asking the interpreter, uh, hey, that didn't seem quite right, what do you think? And that's a lot of lot to put on the interpreter. Uh, it really shows you that um, problems are gonna happen, clearly. Well, thank you for that explanation. Earlier you mentioned your work with prisoners, and I know that your Wilson Clinical Services does a variety of things and all sorts of evaluations. I noticed that um, you do provide forensic services. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you work with courts and the assessments you do and evaluations? Yes. When I sign the word forensic, I use the same sign you might use for legal or law. I hope that's uh, the right sign. 
We do a variety of assessments for the court system. Sometimes there is a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. And an evaluation is required where we see the person did commit a crime. And we have to find out whether they were competent to understand whether they knew they were breaking the law or not. So our team has this discussion frequently because in a language deprivation system situation where there's also a crime has been committed, it can be very tricky. You know, it's bad enough to have language deprivation, but being imprisoned, which is a, there's a high rate of that among people with language deprivation, it's really, really tragic. If you think about the Miranda warning, A lot of times what happens is a deaf person will be arrested, they're given their Miranda rights, but they don't understand them. And so that has implications on that person in their court proceedings. We also do evaluations where we look at the emotional harm that's happening here. For example, I recently had a patient who was working for a very large company and she requested that she use a service animal at her job but the company denied that request and their reason was that she wasn't deaf enough they said you know that phrase is a curious one how can they say that she's not deaf enough I mean what is deaf enough and how on earth would they know? They don't have the capacity to judge that. Going by her behavior and her be ability to interact with hearing people, um, they were saying she was fine. I mean, you know, deaf people are good at acting like they understand, even when they don't. You know, we have this empty nod that we do. And so they told the woman that um, she should just put a mirror on her stool and so when uh, people come up behind her they could she could see if someone was coming up behind her but she had reasons for wanting a service animal a service animal in this case a dog has to be uh, basically signed off on or approved for to work in an employment situation and that requires training and to, for the dog to get training, that would mean her losing time with the animal. And her being trained would mean her losing time at work. And this was a situation that actually went on for over three years. And for many, many reasons, um, you know, she did finally, because of the ADA, get approval to have her dog at work. But by then, we had the COVID virus, so she lost a lot of time. The evaluation in this situation would involve looking at her workplace. Uh, she knew that it was a terrible environment. She knew that it was a stressful environment. She was losing sleep at night. And she had a number of reasons. And our team was able to evaluate that. And she was able to file a lawsuit based on our findings. So, you know, evaluations can vary. We do them for a variety of reasons. Thank you. And you were mentioning your evaluation in the workplace, and I see that another service you offer has to do with organizational consultation. I'm interested in workplace dynamics between deaf, hearing, and hard of hearing people. Have you been involved in any sort of evaluations in that type of setting 
where you've had to deal with morale, uh, changing morale, or making some sort of a shift in the workplace to improve, improve conditions. Yes, organizational consulting is really a fun field, I have to say. And when you were talking about morale in the workplace and how people interact with one another, especially deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing people, I have to say it's unfortunate, but we do have evidence that there are many workplaces, for example, RIT, NTID, and Gallaudet, where we have hearing and deaf people working together. And there are lots of conflicts. Uh, whatever they may pertain to, it could be cultural, it could have to do with having different values, and really, if you put any group of hearing people together, there are going to be conflicts too. When you add a third element of a deaf or hard of hearing person, you're adding a different culture. And quite often, um, in the interview selection of candidates um, in a workplace situation, interesting things happen. So instead of asking, oh, you know, a typical job interview, they'll ask you, uh, tell us, why did you apply for this job? A better situation, a better question might be if you create some sort of a difficult situation or a hypothetical problematic situation, you could ask the candidate, how would you solve this? And in fact, I do remember um, one interview talked about, this was actually a hearing person applying for a job in an organization that was deaf, and this hearing person wanted to be the administrative assistant. So one of the questions was, how would you feel if a deaf person in this organization asked you to pretend to be me, pretend to be a deaf person, and make a phone call to an insurance company requesting payment information? How would you deal with that situation? Would you be comfortable? You know, we want to see their comfort level and the reasons why they would or would not be comfortable. Because oftentimes, um, when a deaf people deaf person tries to make a phone call like that with the operator, with the relay, the insurance company hangs up on the phone call because it seems unusual or odd to them. So if you see a lot of ambivalence on the part of a hearing applicant where they struggle with that gray area, um, they're struggling with the ethics of it, you know, no situation is black and white. So using examples like that are helpful in interviews. Going back to the therapy services that you offer in your clinic, I wonder if there's any research or data on deaf and hard of hearing people and deaf blind people as well on the incidence of stress, anxiety, and depression in general. And also, if you could comment on now with the COVID virus, do you see an increase or is it about the same? What are you noticing? So in general, with deaf and hard of hearing people as a group, there are struggles with depression and anxiety. Often that's because of social isolation, Sometimes it's because people feel like they have difficulty fitting in in the workplace, fitting in in their own families, and they really don't have anyone that they can just talk to. And people really need to have an outlet, and so when they don't have that, anxiety and depression can increase. And we do see that among deaf and hard of hearing people. Now with the COVID, Oh my goodness, we're seeing so many more people coming to our clinic because they don't know what to do about this situation. In the beginning, back in March, 
when the outbreak was starting, we started getting requests for our services, more requests. And we're seeing this in the hearing population as well. They're requesting mental health services, so it's proportionate. We find that a lot of our clients are struggling with some of the information because it's confusing and it's ever-changing. Actually, yesterday I was talking to a deaf mother who has several kids and she was trying to understand the reason behind the schools deciding to not have in-person classes in the Washington area. They suspended in-person classes. Everything was going to be online. And she was disappointed. And she wanted to move to Georgia or just move somewhere, anywhere, where her kids could actually go to school. So I was explaining why the decision was made, that right now they're finding more and more cases in young people. And they're also finding that it's possible that there may be some long-term implications of getting COVID when you're young. We still don't know, but there could be long-term implications and depends on how, what kind of shape you're in. Uh, you could have heart problems. You could have problems with your toes, with circulation. And we don't know what could happen in the future maybe some decline in your mental function, other abnormalities. We just don't know what the long-term impact of this virus could be. So in Washington state, classes are online only. And so we had to explain why that decision was made. When she understood clearly and that it was happening only a few states were actually opening up, she could then decide on the wisdom of that decision and make her own decision. Thank you. Going back to therapy, I wonder if you could talk to us about the therapeutic relationship, what that means, how a deaf or hard of hearing person develops a therapeutic relationship? Is there research on that? If a person has direct communication with their provider, does that lead to a better therapeutic relationship or better therapeutic rapport? I'd love to hear your experience. Yes, the therapeutic relationship that's another topic altogether, and it's a topic I really enjoy. We've heard about how empathy is so important. And it's really a primary issue to be successful. So even with the best tools in your toolbox. You could have everything there. You could be brilliant and funny and have everything to be successful. But if you don't have the ability to connect with others, you're gonna have problems in life. And quite often we see this, and not only in our deaf and hard of hearing clients, but in many other minority populations as well. If individuals, um, you know, don't have the same skin as you, what we're noticing is the ability to relate to someone of the same race or the same ethnic background is really key. And we see improved outcomes when the therapeutic relationship is between people with similar backgrounds so that leads to all sorts of things. If you're deaf or hard of hearing, 
you need cross-disciplinary expertise and partnerships. You might need a neuropsychologist. You might need an MD. You might need a nurse. And it's good to have that cross-disciplinary team and integrated care. That sort of care is crucial. So with our deaf and hard of hearing population that we work with, and research has demonstrated this, there's plenty of evidence that deaf and hard of hearing people are more satisfied, much happier, and show better outcomes when they're in a culturally, linguistically accessible environment for their therapeutic treatment. I've experienced that a few times as well. I'm thinking of one um, situation, uh, a patient that had cultural linguistic abilities. This was a person in their 20s. They were diabetic. They were homeless. They were a drug user. And also they had COPD. So this required a real cross-disciplinary team to help this person. person. So we had to have a cult culturally, linguistically skilled social worker, drug counselor, me as the neuropsychologist, a social worker who could help with housing and communication in sign language. And that was really necessary because housing was crucial for this person. And then in terms of the drug treatment and counseling, that had to be in sign language. And this enables the, enabled the person to stabilize their drug use and, and so forth. But without this coordinated care, it would have been very difficult. And then from the neuropsych evaluation perspe perspective that we were able to provide, we could provide remediation, the right kind of medical treatment, the right sort of medication, the right sort of diagnosis. And we were able to help this person improve enormously so yes, the cross-disciplinary team is critical. And if that doesn't happen with a deaf person uh, who doesn't have cultural linguistic fluency themselves, they can get much worse more quickly. And that's very sad when that happens. I'd done a little bit of research on your background, and I noticed that you offer support groups called Stop Autism, and I'd like to hear more about that. Tell us about that group. Yes, so that support group, Stop Autism. What that means is when you have deaf and hard of hearing people, they face a lot of discrimination simply because they can't hear. And that's really a form of ableism, which means that people who can hear discriminate against people who can't hear, or people who can do something physically discriminate against people with physical disabilities. And I get a lot of complaints from deaf and hard of hearing people here that they just feel like the discrimination is rampant in the workplace, in their families who don't understand them or support them. So we have a social worker here, a master's level counselor, and we talked about this issue. What can we possibly do about it? And we decided to set up this support group, the stop ableism support autism support group and we talk about experiences that people face the struggles that they have with discrimination uh, what it looks like where it surfaces and how to approach it 
how to advocate. Sometimes we'll actually look at a situation and we'll look at a movie, I don't know, like a situation where there isn't even a deaf person. I don't know if you remember the movie 42. We show a film clip where this, uh, an African-American man and his wife go to get on an airplane and they're not allowed to get on the plane. They're told that the airplane is full. But then they let a white person on. I don't know if you remember that film. It was from a while back, but it shows. We show that clip and then we talk about it. And we try to figure out how we can face that situation. What would you do if that happened? What would be the best approach? Uh, people are worried about rocking the boat or causing trouble. And so we talk about skillful ways to approach situations. And if that person, you know, they, if, you know, assuming that a person wants to work with us, we're happy to work on that skill set. I also did a little bit of research on telehealth. And I wonder if you could talk about that. Also, do you offer those services? And if so, could you talk about that? What does it look like? We're seeing it all over the United States right now. Yes, so it's very interesting because when we started researching it, doing telehealth, I was in grad school. And interestingly, we didn't have VRS. It didn't exist in that time. So it was a, it's a new thing. Once it started happening more and more, what we were using was Polycom. And that was the equipment that was used for video conferencing back in the day. And it was used by the military. They had that technology before VRS was invented. So that technology was used overseas but not for us in the US. Then over time, as we began working on it and getting data and finding out the results, VRS, VRS was able to become ubiquitous and more and more companies developed the service. And they, we started to complement one another with our different types of VRS services. And it helps us there's plenty of evidence that deaf and hard of hearing people are growing more comfortable with it. Also, um, you know, with ethnic groups, people, you know, prefer to be with their people alike group. That's happening more and more. So with VRS, it provides an essential service where we can work specifically with deaf and hard of hearing people. We do have research. It basically shows that it can be used, even though you know, in its, where it's in its infancy. And we just keep getting better at it. So with video phones, and we do have one here, we use Sorensen communication. We also have ZVRS. And that's complementary with purple IRS. We also have Convo. And you might wonder why we have all these different video companies serving us. Sometimes, even though we're not supposed to, um, we need to match the technology of our end user. So because we're a business, we are allowed to bend the rules a little bit and provide different companies or different services that don't violate the FCC communication rules. So we're using different services and we're providing treatment through those telecommunication systems. Since COVID started, I can even do neuropsych evaluations through telemedicine. It's not the same as face-to-face, -face, but we have to make do. Great. Well, thank you for that information. 
I also noticed that um, you've worked with the military and you know, there's a lot of hearing loss in veterans. There's a large group of deaf of veterans who have experienced hearing loss. Can you tell me about that? Yes, so my residency was in Florida, but uh, before I moved here to Washington State, interestingly enough, I did an internship at a medical center in South Florida. And when I was there, I was trying to find a good residency. And I know that Washington State, you know where South Florida is. I had to move way across the country, literally, to uh, from the sunshine state to the rainy state for my residency, it, which just sounds just so crazy. What a change it was. But it was hard to find an apartment. It was a tough uh, time. Uh, it's funny because in Florida, you are always asking if you have air conditioning, but that's not a question you necessarily ask when you move to Seattle or, or anywhere in Washington State. Anyway, I was working with uh, in a medical center. And that was a veterans hospital. And I started working my residency there with uh, veterans. And oh my goodness, this was after Afghanistan. And there were so many bombings in Afghanistan as well as Iraq. And when the veterans would come back, they had hearing loss because of the loud noises, the guns, the bombs, and so forth. So hearing loss was rampant, and I would meet with these people, these people who didn't know what to do. The veterans would ask me, you know, what can I do? And they were really struggling to adapt and get used to not only civilian life, but civilian life with a hearing loss. Um, it affected their marriages. If they were single, it affected their uh, future prospects. and Their whole lives had changed, and I felt so badly for them. Um, they used to enjoy music. Now they couldn't enjoy music. They um, couldn't use the telephone effectively. You know, or uh, they were afraid to try things, uh, social interactions, because even if they could hear 25 or 75 percent of the time, which is a lot, they were still missing 25 percent of the conversation. And that was anxiety producing. So I worked in that medical center with those veterans. And we looked at technology and we could see how it might be helpful. For people who are older, um, that's one thing, but for people in their mid 30s and 40s, it's another thing. We even had folks in their 60s. And they were past a point in their lives where they were really interested in learning sign language. So we had to be creative about how we could come up with technology that would really help them and support them. So we created several apps and we tested um, VRS with them. We were, you know, we had so many people deployed and working there at the time. It was such a great experience because I had an opportunity to be there for quite a while for my residency. The environment obviously was um, full of people with hearing loss, but the cultural aspect of deafness was missing. And I thought perhaps my expertise could be better used elsewhere, if I could serve people with hearing loss, but also serve people with a deaf cultural background. And that's really why I decided to go into private practice from that residency. And I've been in private practice now in Tacoma for 10 years. Yes, and I hear a very successful private practice as well. This program where we spotlight deaf and hard of hearing professionals 
And also, um, we're interested in targeting students and future medical professionals. I wonder if you have any advice for them for their future. What would you say to them? Well, my biggest piece of advice is to follow your passion. It's so important to do what you love. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, it's not worth pursuing. So you really need to make sure that you're having fun and enjoying your job, whatever that may be, and continue doing that. And if there are barriers, and there will be barriers, if you're passionate enough, that will be enough to overcome those barriers. Thank you. Also, the organization, AMPHIL, A-M-P-H-I-L, I believe you were the president of the organization. Maybe you still are the president? Okay, tell me more about that. Okay, so AMPHIL is, oh, what a treasure it is. It's the Association of Medical Providers with Hearing Loss. And really, what a great organization. I can't think of a better place to get support. If anyone wants to be involved with the organization, if they're interested in healthcare, they're deaf or hard of hearing, even interpreters are more than welcome to participate in our meetings and get involved with AMPHIL. So AMPHIL provides a lot of opportunities for people to get mentorship, to get advocacy, to be educated and trained. And that'll be a, a great thing for healthcare students. If they have the passion, they need to find a mentor. And that's really an, a key to success, is having a mentor. So that's uh, AMPHIL is a wonderful organization for that. I served as president for two years. And the terms are two years each. So I served for my two years. It was very rewarding for me. It was also a lot of work. My wife was home at the time, and she's a nurse. So, oh, we should get her involved in this interview as well. Oh, definitely. I'm not even sure if she'd be willing at this point because right now she hasn't been practicing for a while. We have three children, and so she's been busy with them. We have a nine-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a five-year-old. So with three kids at home, she's been very, very busy taking care of them. So Amphil took time away from her, from my wife and from my family, because I had all that responsibility. But it was well worth it. It was a great experience. And I got so much back from that community. We had conferences every couple of years. And the last conference was in Baltimore, Maryland in Jan June 19, 2019, before the virus, thank goodness. We have so many wonderful workshops. We talk about how to work with hearing people, how to connect well with hearing people, <clears throat> how um, interpreters can learn the vocabulary to work in a medical setting. There are so many interesting workshops on how to run a code blue. You can't imagine the variety what a great experience Amphil has been. Thank you. Okay, I do have one last question. In the hearing community, as well as the deaf and hard of hearing community, there's a little bit of, I want to say, stigma about seeking mental health services or counseling services. I'm wondering if you have 
anything to say about that stigma or what we could do to reduce the stigma of seeking treatment. And then a second part to that question is, many deaf and hard of hearing people are concerned about their privacy, about going to see a therapist. They might um, be concerned uh, about going in and possibly seeing other deaf people in the waiting room. And I'm wondering if you could talk about those two issues. Oh, sure, absolutely. What a great question. First of all, in terms of stigma, um, it's very, that happened in the military as well. That's a population in which there's a lot of stigma about seeking mental health services. In the military, what they, what we tried to do was educate people constantly and explain that mental health issues are really just like having physical health issues. There's really not a big distinction. There's a lot of overlap between the two. So for example, if someone is struggling with diabetes, they may also struggle with depression because the two things co-occur. So treatment is necessary. I know the old model was to work in silos. So services would be separated. You might have a heart, a cardiologist working with someone who had heart issues. And then that person might go and see a dietitian in a separate clinic. And then they might be getting physical therapy somewhere else, and they might have had other types of therapies somewhere else. But now what we're noticing is that we're having more partnerships and more cross-training, and people can basically get one-stop services. Research has shown that even in the general hearing public, we get much better outcomes if the services are coordinated. I have also noticed that regarding the stigma, the best way to face it or address it is through education. We need to explain to people that, you know, physical problems and Emotional problems may go hand in hand. Now you mentioned privacy and how we deal with that with our deaf and hard of hearing patients. And privacy for deaf people, it's almost impossible to ensure because, you know, it's, it's such a small community then an interpreter might be involved. It might be an interpreter that they know or don't know. It's very intimate in that setting. And so once they see that person outside the setting, it gets to be awkward. The important thing for deaf and hard of hearing people to know is therapy and the therapeutic rapport is so important. That relationship is critical. And that's where trust can be built. And once that trust is built, there can be successful outcomes versus working in a more of a hearing setting with an interpreter. So we meet with the individual, we commend them on seeking services in the first place because it takes so much courage to do that. So we always commend people for that. And we know that the decision is not something that's arrived at easily. And we see that they value direct communication. We try to accommodate their preference. We could even talk about it as an experiment that um, good for you for trying this and taking the first step. Thank you. 
Before we close for today, I wonder if there's anything that I haven't asked you or anything you'd like to add before we close today. I know I've asked you so many questions. No, I've really enjoyed this. It's been a great conversation with you, Christine. Um, and what a pleasure to talk to you about these issues. I really appreciate all the research you did too, looking into my background. Well, I always do my homework before these interviews. Well, I appreciate that. It really shows. And um, I want you to know that if you think of another question you hadn't asked me, feel free to contact me anytime in the future. I'll be happy to come back on. Thank you. You've really supported our work here in Rhode Island, and I appreciate your time so much. I know how busy you are. If anyone in our community wants to reach out to you, would it be okay with you if I posted your contact information at the end of this video? And then they can contact you. Yes, thank you for that. I appreciate you doing that. That would be great. Wonderful. Again, thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Oh, yes. And I hope to meet you in person sometime. Maybe at an AMFIL conference down the road. Who knows? Yeah, I think this year, or it's going to be in San Francisco, but they had to cancel. Where is it? In, in two, is it annual or is it semi-annual? It's every two years. So the board hasn't decided where we'll have it. Uh, if it's going to be virtual or if it's going to be postponed another year to 2022, we don't know yet, but we should be making a decision soon. Wonderful. Well, let me know. I'd love to come to one of your conferences. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice to meet you.